Let's do I, it. I've been at Google for, for for almost a year now, and one of the one of my favorite things about about working here is the availability of, of people who have like real in-depth knowledge of, of how the browser works. Uh, and like a lot of the assumptions I had as, as a developer just didn't hold true, and, and they were able to show me why. So it's great to bring that to, to a wider audience. So for the first talk today, uh, please give a warm welcome to Greg, Greg Simon and Eric Seidel. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Is this on? Perfect. All right, terrific. Uh, I'm Greg Simon. Uh, I work on the Blink team here at uh, Chrome. And I'm Eric Seidel, also work on the Blink team. Uh, <clears throat> so when Eric and I were uh, coming up with a plan of what we were going to talk about today, we tried to put ourselves in your shoes and say, what would we, you know, what would we like to hear from the people working on the actual browser engine? Uh, what do you have, you know, what what do you have coming new in the next six months that that I can use? And what have you been doing since you forked, you know, WebKit? Um, and so that's basically the structure of our talk today. We have th three sections. Yeah, push this button here. It's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. <clears throat> and it doesn't work. How do we get there? How do we get here? Meaning, what happened since we forked WebKit? And what we're going to be doing, you know what, this isn't working that great. And how can I best influence? Because at the end of the day, the folks that work on Blink at Chromium really work for you guys, right? We publish a new developer API basically every six weeks because that's yeah. what Chrome's you know shipping schedule is. So we're going to start by having Eric. Uh, he's gonna, gonna, going to talk a bit about what 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 we've done since mm -hmm. we forked, and we're actually really we're really fortunate to have Eric here, um, here today. He's worked on on the source code base for like about eight years, right? Something like that. The longest of uh, of anyone uh, on the Chrome team. So yeah. So Blink, Blink, very exciting, or at least very exciting for us. Uh, as Greg mentioned, we've been here about eight months. April 4th was our big D-Day. Uh, we were WebKit or part of the WebKit community, and we forked to have Blink, a separate uh, open source project. First thing we did is we deleted half our source code, um, half of which we didn't necessarily need. And then we've spent a lot of time taking our tangled integration with Chrome and trying to make it look a little bit more like this. Uh, we're still maybe not done. Um, but what I want to talk about first is non-code changes to Blink, but rather process changes. Because I think this is the part that is most affects the people in this, in this room and on the live stream. Uh, this is the part that's maybe most observable to those who don't hack on the Blink code base. So one big change that we made is we added an intense system. We wanted to make sure that our decision-making process for what we change about the web platform is an open process and one that you can participate in. So every time before we're going to change the web platform, we send a public announcement to Blink Dev uh, announcing our intent to add a feature or to remove a feature. Then we go off and we code it. And then the very next day after it's checked in, it's already there shipping in our Canary builds. It's off by default, but you can turn it on using about flags experimental feature. We get feedback from you during that process. We get feedback from our own internal testing or testing in the open source project. and then. The second email that's sent, again, to our public mailing list is an intent to ship. And this is where we evaluate, is this feature far enough down the standards process? Do web devs like it? Because again, the feature that we implemented behind that flag is the exact feature that as specified by the spec. No prefixes, no nothing. Uh, and then once it's approved by the community to say, we can commit to this indefinitely, then it appears in Chrome. Uh, so even if you're not following on our mailing list, we try to make it very easy for you to be informed as to our feature development process. You go to chromestatus.com. You can see the features that we've worked on, the features that we've shipped, the features that we're planning to deprecate. Uh, and even if you're not paying attention to that, we announce all feature changes on the Chromium releases blog uh, with links to bugs, which you can get to the tracker dashboard, which you can get to, uh, to the original discussions on the mailing list. I actually forgot to mention on the tracker dashboard, you can edit this. This We try to track not just Chrome changes, but also the status of these features in other browsers. And if you have information about that, you can request edit access and change it yourself. So another big policy change which affects, again, uh, particularly web developers, is that this WebKit prefix that we had in the WebKit world, we're trying to remove from Blink. And additionally, we have no plans to add a Blink vendor prefix. We think this is a good thing. Uh, 
Instead, we implement, flag, we implement features exactly as they're specified behind a runtime flag, which means that you can access them way sooner than you used to be able before when we implement behind a compile time flag. Uh, so to talk about other code changes that we've made, or so that was some process bits, let's talk about some code. We've removed lots of code, as we mentioned in the very first slide, uh, including a bunch of broken WebKit uh, features or features of the web platform that were added 20 years ago but never worked. Um, we have not done this in the dark. We have done this using data from anonymously reported aggregate statistics by Chrome users who opt in with the I want to report my anonymous usage data. And this is, again, all public. You go to chromestatus.com, and you can see here we're tracking uh, the usage of uh, CSS features across the web. So if you scroll down this list, you'll see ones that are used in 0.0001% of websites, and those are the ones that are on the chopping block. So yes, so other code changes. One of the major focus that you heard Linus talk about, which you've heard other talks talk about, is that we live in a multi-platform web, and, or a multi-device web. And it's important for consistency across those devices, something we've not done super well at uh, up until now. And so one of the focuses of the last six months uh, has been to try and improve that story across versions of Chrome and across now versions of Blink. Uh, a big part of that was shipping Android WebView. But you can see we still have a lot of work ahead of us. This is a benchmark on the web, HTML5 test, which shows that, yeah, things are getting way better. We're much closer to desktop in terms of having one set of web platform APIs everywhere, but we're still not quite there. Uh, so to demo the at least getting better part, Greg is going to give us a demo of one of the new features <clears throat> that shipped in the latest yeah, so, Android. Yeah, this is the, uh, so one of the most requested features uh, uh, in Chrome on Android was the Web Audio API. Uh, and we finally, we, uh, we, we finally have it working. Um, what it is is it's a JavaScript uh, API that lets you assemble um, audio graphs uh, with uh, different sort of audio processing nodes, things that you wouldn't normally write JavaScript to actually run because they're fairly performance sensitive. And so you can do very, very cool things. Do you need to see that? Oh, yeah. Which is the? It's the camera. There it is. There you go. Okay, cool. Never live. So here I've got, I'm just playing a loop, and as I drag my finger, I'm changing parameters on a bike watt filter that is part of, you know, the audio, the audio processing line. And I can be my own DJ. <laughs> and again, this is a like, very small amount of code. But, you know, these are things that, uh, people like to do, so <laughs> here it is. And you couldn't it's, do before. It's, it's also it. really, really useful for games, because you can actually place sounds in, in uh, different parts of space. You know, probably. So. Uh, so we're making lots of changes. And as you saw, we're removing lots of code. But one of the things we were asked to talk about in this talk was a little bit about how the sausage gets made, what happens behind the scenes, and to, I guess, reassure that we are trying to make sure th or working very hard to make sure that we aren't breaking things as we go. So one of the things we do to keep the wheels on the wagon is a lot of testing. Every single change we make to Blink is tested immediately by over 30,000 tests. Uh, and that's just the Blink tests, not to mention all the Chromium tests that run additionally uh, later. And you can see, again, all these are, are public. You can see all our thousands of bots. You can see some of the tools that we use to diagnose failures. Um, you don't need that necessarily for, for your worlds, but it's public in case you want it. Uh, also, we focus a lot on security. Uh, you, there's a link at the bottom you can click to learn more. But we have systems that throw millions and millions of broken web pages at our engine to make sure it doesn't fall over. And sometimes when I make a change that to one part of the web platform that interacts badly with another part of the web platform that you didn't necessarily expect, we, uh, this sort of system catches it an hour later. It's kind of amazing. We do the same kind of things with speed. We have thousands and thousands of benchmarks that we run on every change. And we have a 24-hour sheriffing of these 
bots in these graphs that alert us when we've regressed speed. And then they have a little button here we can click to bisect and find out exactly which change uh, caused that speed regression. Very powerful technology. Yeah, this was, uh, this was something that we realized last year. We had way too mm -hmm. many graphs that we couldn't have humans track them anymore. Mm -hmm. So we used some signal processing that was available for, uh, from inside Google to actually, to actually not only uh, detect when things get slower, but when things get faster, get too. Faster so too. we have like, you know, you know, perf increase of the week, you know, email that gets sent out, et cetera. <laughs> it's very, very cool. Very much a focus of ours. We're also not just trying to not get slower. We're also focused on getting faster. One of the things that this same team produced for us in the last couple months is uh, they ran a million websites on desktop through uh, the browser and, and took aggregate statistics. And they also did the top 25K on mobile. Mobile significantly slower. Uh, so it takes a lot of hours of mobile. And what you can see on this is this, this graph is actually really very depressing to me. Um, because the blue and the orange is you, and the rest is us getting in your way. And that's a problem. It's something we're very aware of and actively working on fixing. And the graphs have actually gotten a little bit better since then. We've started to tick away at the low-hanging fruit, but we have a long way to go. So Greg's going to talk about what else is coming down the pipeline. <clears throat> cool. Thanks, Eric. So what, are, so what new APIs, what new performance parts are you going to see in the next six months? Well, first of all, a biggie is, 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 is web components. So this is something that Eric Beidelman covered pretty well in his talk about Polymer. Uh, we've been working on this for almost three years. Um, of course, nearly every JavaScript you know, UI framework has its, has its own component model because that's sort of bo you know, you know, a boilerplate uh, for doing UIs. And it means that you have to buy in totally to one framework, you, and it's very, it's very, it's it's very tricky to mix and match them. So we decided three years ago to work on building this functionality into the platform to, to make UI frameworks much more lightweight, uh, and um, and also fix some of the the you know namespacing problems uh, you know that you have. So there are three parts. There's the shadow DOM where you can encapsulate. Uh, DOM, so it can't be walked through or seen, et cetera. We've actually been shipping this for uh, using uh, the um, the video player works with mm -hmm. this. Uh, it, um, this was even prior to us forking uh, on Blink. Mm -hmm. We have we have uh, um, custom elements where you can actually create your own your own tags so that your code looks much more readable. And we also have HTML imports. Um, which, <clears throat> uh, which uh, aids with pulling in, bl uh, you know, uh, blocks of content or, in, uh, you know, uh, pulling in actual components. You know, so this is this is coming soon. We we have a last call on custom elements for this month. Um, the other two, we're working hard to uh, to get the specs, you know, in a shape where we where we feel where we we feel that we can sh that we can ship it. But you don't have to wait for that. You can start using it today because we've written polyfills for every evergreen browser that implements all three of these things. So, you know, when Chrome actually turns it on, things will just get faster if you if you ship today. Web animation. So for UI these days, having silky smooth complex uh, movement is now table stakes, right? You know, thinks, uh, and so. You can't, uh, uh, you know. So um, we, you know, realize this, and so we've been working for the past six months on a, uh, on a new animation backend that's going to replace the one that drives SVG and and also the one that drives CSS. And we're also going to be exposing a new API called the Web Animations API. Now, what's cool about this API is. Uh, it is uh, timeline based, and it actually. So here, you know, we have a new animation object here, um, but you can also group them together. So you can actually create fairly complex animations that are that are all synchronized. So let me show you an example of how that works. After I turn on the tablet here, Oops. after I unlock it. Okay, cool. So here is a simple you know, animation here. You can see I'm running on a tablet here. So I've got, this is actually much smoother than that. <laughs> the problem is it, it doesn't seem you know, to capture you know, well here. Um, I, you know, I, I have a few curves here. And you know, ease in and ease out. 
And now, of course, we don't have the native implementation of web, of, of web, web animations uh, um, shipped yet. I think mm -hmm. it sort of runs, but it's, it yeah. certainly isn't shipping. This is all done with the web animations polyfill. The same team in Blink that is working on shipping web animations and writing the new backend, they started by doing a polyfill. And that's what Polymer uses um, as well. Another example of uh, web animations here, where so here I've got two separate, uh, two, uh, two, two separate animations, and they're going to run on the same timeline. So they're perfectly in sync. When you use the web, when you, when you use this API, you, you you will always be getting the a GPU as well. So <laughs> very very cool stuff. So that's going to ship some. That's going to ship sometime next year. But as as I said before, you don't have to wait to use it. You can grab yep. the polyfill and and start using it immediately. Partial layout. <clears throat> One of the wonderful things about the web is that it does layout for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just throw text at it, right? It's the only platform where where you know, Hello World is actually just the text Hello World. Uh, of course, this is also one of the problems with the web is that it's doing layout when you don't really want it to. Like you just want to reach into the DOM and measure uh, where one div is placed. And what, you know, what happens is the clicker doesn't work. What happens is uh, we, uh, we lay out the entire page. And so what should have been a you know, sub millisecond call ended up taking 25 milliseconds and I just missed a frame. All right. So we have changed Blink, so it now does partial layout, meaning it will only lay out enough of the page to return the value that you're asking for from, and then it will carefully unwind itself. Now, this ha but now even though we've done this already, we haven't shipped it yet because we've got two, we have two other problems that we're, that we're dealing with. One is on Chrome on Android, uh, we do double layouts because we have to do uh, text auto sizing. Um, and then on uh, desktop, we're working on getting uh, um, overflow uh, scroll bars turned on because the presence of a scroll bar causes you to do extra layouts anyway. Speaking of, te of, text, te te of text auto sizing, anyone who's loaded a page, a desktop page in a browser, and the page author hasn't set meta viewport, uh, we'll, we'll see this sort of behavior where we basically lay out the whole page, we try to identify what the main body of content is, we set a minimum on, on the font size, and then we lay it out again. Now, the algorithm could certainly be, could certainly be improved, as you can see by this. You know, we've got, uh, this, is, um, this, this is Hacker News talking about the Moto G, I believe, and all this text should be the same size, but it's not. So we are working on that. Uh, as I speak here today, uh, but we're also going to do it in a single pass. You know, you know, as I mentioned when talking about partial layout, we can't quite ship partial layout until we can actually until 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 we only have to until we're we're able to do just one pass. So this is coming very 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 soon. CSS grid. Uh, tw Twenty years ago, I worked on the web browser for the Apple Newton. Actually, tw 21 years ago. And one of our features was tables, and it took a lot of code to write tables. It was, you know, because, uh, and I'm still talking about tables, and it's 20 years later. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> it's time for some 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 improvement in this area. So CSS Grid was a feature that was first shipped by Internet Explorer. We have it uh, pretty much fully implemented. Uh, at least I say pretty much because the spec is doing is is in last call, but it's still kind of being yeah. pushed around a bit. You know. Um, you can turn it on and try it out, but uh, we we expect to ship this very very soon. What's cool about CSS Grid, of course, is you can separate the content from how from how it appears. So if, if you combine this with uh, with media queries, uh, you can do uh, really uh, really great responsive design. Speaking of responsive images, this is something that you guys want, something that we want. But we don't have it yet, and that's because there hasn't been agreement on what the API looks like. There's been many patches landed inside Blink, for, of course, you know they haven't shipped yet. But there's some disagreement about whether it should, whether it should be um, picture, source set, source set. I think it's not going to be source set now. I think it's now source set or like picture. It but honestly, daily. it changes almost daily. Yeah. I mean, uh, 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 I did these slides last week, and I and I had to add the picture tag in yesterday because that was <laughs> the latest news. You know, uh, I know 
I know you, you may think it would be great if we, if, if we just put our foot down and just ship something, and, uh, but, but then, we're not, then we're forking the web platform, right? I mean, we really need to have, you know, the success of the web is that it's consistent. Uh, and so it's important that we take our time and get at least one other browser to agree and ship. You know, ideally, we get every browser to do it as well. This is also uh, subpixel fonts. The fonts on Windows don't look that great. Yeah. <laughs> they can certainly be improved. A year ago, we shipped the change in WebKit, actually uh, a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. which was we changed the rendering, the rendering uh, precision of the entire tree uh, to, to be fixed point. Prior to that, it was a mixture of int and float. If you put a breakpoint in there or just like pause the program and looked at the call stack, it was a float, float, int, int, float. And of course, things were you know, off by one pixel you know, constantly. We got that fixed. Uh, the last thing to fix, though, is fonts. Of course, you, you know, looking at the column on the column, the column on the left, this looks like you know a web page from 1998 when the only font that you were drawing was Arial because it was in the C Windows folder, and I didn't do anti-aliasing because my CPU wasn't that powerful, etc. Uh, the column on the right is what's going to be coming very soon, I think this quarter. Um, and so you're going to have not only subpixel sizing, but subpixel uh, uh, um, uh, um, positioning as well. You know, most web content these days is, is consumed on LCD screens, so you can use clear type or uh, even you know, increasingly uh, you know, retina displays. So this is important. Now, it's kind of hard on this overhead to see the difference. Uh, it's very subtle. Um, look, whoa, what did I just do? I, I, I guess I'm printing it. Who puts a print button on a, on a presentation remote? That doesn't seem, doesn't seem that good. <laughs> that seems like a fail. Ah, there it is. OK, cool. All right. That's, oh, well. Uh, look at this E here. It's, see, on. On the left, it's much more janky. <laughs> very, very subtle, right? Um, so this is direct right. This was actually a big change. Skia, which is the graphic system inside, uh, uh, inside, um, inside Blink, or I guess that Blink uses, mm -hmm. to you know to be correct, uh, it used GDI, uh, which is the real, which is a really, really old uh, um, graphics API on on Win32, and you have to use GDI in order to ship on Windows XP. But starting with Vista, I believe, they turned on direct write. So this is coming very, very, very soon in a canary you know, near you. Uh, <clears throat> this was a slide uh, uh, um, provided by our friends at V8. V8's not part of Blink, but it's an extremely uh, you know, important piece of, uh, of Chrome and a really important piece of, of your life as well. Uh, the speed team is, they are, they are maniacs about speed, I mean, which is great. And they'll always be maniacs about speed because that's one, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's what's called V8 and not in V6 or like I4 or something, right? Um, but coming in the next six months, we're going to be bringing, we're going to be um, improving some of the ES6 support, things like symbols and iterators, you know, et cetera, mm -hmm. and also something called object observe. Uh, I'm not sure if Eric, um, Beidelman covered this yesterday, but a couple of years ago in Blink, we shipped DOM mutations, where you can set up a callback to, uh, so you know when part of the DOM has changed. Uh, so Object Observe is a new, a, new, um, a new ECMAScript feature that is the same thing but for JavaScript objects. So given any, arbitrary, uh, given any arbitrary object, you can watch when properties on it change. So, so if you put, put two, and two, two and two together, you now have got data binding natively in the platform. And it's fast, right? Because it's really tricky to, to, to polyfill object observe. <laughs> we do do it in Polymer, but it's not the nicest piece of code I've ever seen. OK, cool. So how can you influence these features and things that we work on? Um, you actually can. <laughs> yeah. As Greg said, uh, you know, you guys are king. Uh, as history has proven many times, a platform is nothing without its apps, and you guys write the apps. So we want to know what you have to say. Um, if you feel C++ in your blood and want to write C++ with us, all of our code is, is open. You don't even have to tell anybody. Um, you can just simply change it. 
uh, you rather you don't have to evangelize to us. You can just simply post a patch. Uh, all of our code is open. Our bug tracker is open. Uh, one of the critical step or one of the paths on the one of the steps on the critical path to anything getting changed in Blink, at least anything web facing, is a bug. So whether you file that bug or we file that bug, uh, again, you guys know what it should look like probably better than we do. Uh, and you have access to our bug tracker. You can see what we're working on. You can influence what we're working on. Another way that internal web devs, to Google at least, uh, help us to improve is through reducing test cases. Often a bug will come in and you know, we don't necessarily understand your complicated web app. And so helping us to understand, explaining it to us like, like we're five, as it says on the slide, uh, is an important step. Because every change that we make needs a test. And so whether you write that test or we write that test, it has to be written. Um, longer term is the question of standards. As Greg mentioned, part of the beauty of the web is that it's ubiquitous, that it works more or less the same everywhere you try. And the way we accomplish that is through standards. So they're always looking for folks like yourselves who understand the web platform to help the standards bodies to determine what the next web platform should look like. If we're moving too slow or standards are moving too slow, you can always fix it yourself in JavaScript to some extent. And that's one of the techniques that has become uh, bigger, as we mentioned earlier in the slide, for us to sort of test out new features, for you to test out new features, just to simply write it in JS. Uh, and finally, if you guys do nothing else, we simply want to hear from you. That's why we're here today. That's why we're talking to the live stream, uh, is that you guys, again, are in charge of the apps, and we want to know what you have to think. So you can listen in, join in to our conversations on Blink Dev. You can talk to us on Plus. You can talk to us on Twitter. But we want to hear from you. Yeah, and we will be around, uh, I guess, an hour from now or so. Uh, and you know, we would really like to hear, you know, are we working on the right stuff? Should we, should we be prioritizing you know, something different, you know, et cetera? It's, you know, it really matters to us. So, so OK. Thank you. Thanks.